Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all at Paris Talks from Islamabad, Pakistan. I'm very pleased to return yet again, albeit virtually, to Paris Talks, which remains one of my favorite speaking events due to its refreshingly innovative approach. This year's theme, The Cure, is clearly reflective of a tremendously challenging year the entire global community has endured due to the COVID pandemic. In this background, I will be sharing with you my thoughts on an important cure, a cure for peacekeeping, peace building using a gendered approach. As a Pakistani legislator, cabinet member, UN peacekeeping has always been a subject which has been close to my heart because Pakistan has been a true contributing country since the very inception of UN peacekeeping. We have seen over the years how our troops and increasingly Pakistani female peacekeepers have been actively engaged in conflict zones, taking on the blue helmet responsibilities with pride, precision, persistence, and panache. As a former Minister for Social Protection with a focus on women empowerment, I have been actively involved with rebuilding lives of chronically poor, often in conflict zones. As such, in October 2020, I authored my fourth book, which was titled Gender, Pakistan and UN Peacekeeping. The objective was to share my expertise on what I believed in my humble professional experience has worked, can work, and should be implemented in conflict zones to build back lives of those who matter the most, the marginalized, the vulnerable. Today, I will share some of these experiences with this august audience of Paris Talks, especially the peace building, gender reform agenda, as well as an assessment of how gender has been an increasing focus of the current UN leadership in presenting itself as a cure. Certainly, whilst the history of UN peacekeeping goes back to 1948, the gendered approach truly did take off with the famous UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on October 31st, 2000, which created a link between women, peace, and security. Similarly, there have been significant amount of UN Security Council resolutions post UNSC 1325, which have tackled conflict-related sexual violence, addressed women's leadership in peacekeeping operations, and strengthened enforcement mechanisms of the original UNSCR 1325. Fast forward to 2020 and 2021, and we will see a tightened emphasis on gender mainstreaming by UN leadership. The question is to ask why, and the answer is fairly logical simply because a gendered approach to peace building pays immense and immediate dividends for conflict resolution and the sustainability of peace. There is a complete agreement on the fact that women, when involved in peacekeeping, at whatever level, will improve sexual gender-based violence indicators because of their empathy, trust they exude, versus the masculinized masculinity of the opposite sex. Moreover, their inclusion also leads to better intelligence gathering in local populations. They're most useful in post-conflict reconstruction efforts of legal and constitutional reforms, election preparation, mine reforms, and DDR, disarmament, demobilization, reintegration. Their inclusion in police helps manage local populations better. The list of the gender dividends in peacekeeping is frankly endless. Therefore, it is no small wonder that the UN Secretary General has been quoted as saying that we must ensure full, equal, and meaningful participation of women at all stages of the peace process, and that we must systematically integrate a gendered perspective into all stages of analysis, planning, implementation, and reporting. In fact, the focus of UNDPO has been to achieve inclusive and sustainable peace outcomes in line with the Secretary General's famous Action Peacekeeping Initiative, AFOP. The DPO has also been at the forefront to turn women peace security commitments into a reality through the Generation Equality Campaign. The SG's words, women's leadership is a cause. We must make it a norm. That is how we will transform international peace and security, have indeed been at the cornerstone of this impetus on a gendered approach. At the same time, there's an important realization also by the SG that while women in the front lines brokering peace in local communities, they continue to be actively sidelined once those processes move to the national and international levels. It is important to understand, therefore, why the UN Peace Building Report of October 2020, coming at the 20th anniversary of the famous UN uh, Security Council Resolution 1325, takes stock of hits and misses of two decades of gender performance, whilst clearly underlining certain focus areas which are critical for a gendered approach. One, prioritize and invest in community-based local women's networks. Two, harness data and gender analysis for accountable decision-making. Three, accelerate and leverage women's mobilization to transform peace and political processes. Four, systemize women's leadership to inform conflict prevention and resolution mediation and protection. Five, 
create dynamic and innovative partnerships to enhance women's participation. There is no doubt that UNSG and UNDPO leadership can pride themselves in 2021 on certain achievements on the gender front. Primarily, women in leadership roles is being encouraged at all levels, whether at the UN leadership peacekeeping level or the women peacekeepers in combat level or the women in organizations assisting UN peacekeepers level or simply in the post-conflict governments. This would mean women members in local governments, national assemblies, or upper houses of parliament of conflict zone states. Investments, investment is being made in community-based women's networks as equal partners. These networks are using innovative community approaches to resolving conflict, waging peace and reconciliation, especially in COVID decision-making, including the elevated advocacy for the UNSG's global ceasefire call. Women's empowerment projects are being encouraged and women from diverse backgrounds and communities are being brought under one platform to create cooperatives for improving livelihoods. These networks are assisting electoral voter registrations and increasing women voter turnouts. Identification and profiling women ex-combatants has increased through these networks as well. UN peacekeepers have collaborated many a times with other UN agencies like UN Women, UNDP, and the Inter International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance to improve the legislative frameworks by success transfers and sharing learning experiences from one conflict zone to another. Constitution drafting has been improved by these shared experiences too. On the challenges side, ladies and gentlemen, due to COVID, there have been restrictions on women's movement, increase in violence against them, and decrease in their access to rescue, health, and essential services, unfortunately. They have also faced economic hardships in COVID, as the civic space has shrunk with women's disproportionate exposure to COVID as frontline workers in the health sector. As such, the reform agenda I will propose today in Paris becomes even more important in this pandemic as a cure. Ladies and gentlemen, these challenges, challenges can be addressed. While some peacekeeping missions have better online facilities enabling bi-communal dialogue and trust building work to continue, others don't. Cyprus and Kosovo are good examples of how women's organizations and walks move to the virtual world and joint statements continued in that zone. With low literacy and the digital divide, such options closed for some peacekeeping zones. And there the challenge has been greater in COVID. In zones like CAR, DRC, South Sudan, and Mali, gender advocacy shifted to local radio stations and distribution of solar-powered radios to the women. So every challenge has come with a set of solutions. Even though women are severely and underrepresented in decision-making processes, the odd success stories of women parliamentary speakers being appointed for example, in Kosovo, have encouraged other areas to start lobbying along the same lines. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see from the above expose, the cure for a gendered focus approach to peacekeeping and peace building has already arrived. What I wish to share with you in the next half is a further elaboration of how that cure can be fine-tuned and expanded, especially during the pandemic. The first cure is a focus on gender data management through household registries. When large groups of people who are not identified on state household registries, either because they are nomadic or they're stationary, but not accessible to government peace building machineries, become stateless and invisible to the state for all development purposes, we definitely need a cure. This aggravates their plight in conflicts. Demographics often become a source of uh, political controversy in conflicts since they are key for resource allocation, which is always scarce. The cure needs to be credible, accurate, up to date, real-time and complete data gathering of all households. There are many technologies which have already been tested on improving household registries for stationary as well as nomadic populations. Thus, this cure exists. The challenge is to implement it where it is not being implemented. Whilst this cure can be considered costly, its development advantages outweigh the cost significantly since targeted efforts at developing those in need of development and assisting those stuck in the spiral of conflict can take place. These plans can be targeted uh, to those who are identified versus those who are invisible. The first priority in these cases is to take women as head of household so that automatically they lead in peace processes and development efforts in peace building. This creates a poverty and a prone to conflict scientific scorecard, which in turn can equalize distribution of limited funds in conflict zones, improve food subsidies, subsidies, avoid duplication, and manage conflict resolution systems more efficiently. 
The second cure, ladies and gentlemen, is an active pursuit of a women empowerment legislative agenda in conflict zones. This cure is already being pursued in many peacekeeping missions, as mentioned above. What I am proposing is a prioritization of the following specific legislative agenda across the board. One, access to financial inclusions with e-commerce opportunities for conflict-prone, vulnerable, chronic poor. Two, violence protection legislations, including asset crime control legislation, domestic violence, femicide, and honor killing legislation. Three, climate smart livelihood and income generating legislation. Four, legislation prohibiting early marriage. Five, gender pay gap legislation. Six, meaningful participation in democracy and decision-making through quotas legislation. Seven, sexual harassment and women trafficking prohibitive legislation. Eight, reproductive child and maternal health legislation. Nine, psychiatric health assistance legislation for survivors of conflict. There is enough ed evidence, ladies and gentlemen, to suggest that the above nine point legislative agenda is complete enough to handle women empowerment indicators in conflict zones because the issues identified by peacekeeping forces on ground necessitates action in all these specific areas. The way to implement on fast track is to create a high level cell which looks at the legislative models that have worked in similar zones and success transfer without wasting any time on reinventing the wheels. Legislative processes are cumbersome and complicated in the most advanced of developing country, developed and developing countries. Thus, an effort needs to be made to simplify the processes and to learn from parliaments which where uh, the most efficient legislative amendment processes have functioned. And finally, many zones are functioning in colonial era legal, legal frameworks, which need immediate updating. The third cure, ladies and gentlemen, is promoting the right health agenda, especially in the midst of the pandemic. I propose the following five-point health plan. One, women and girls can be protected from disease and death by establishing suitable healthcare systems through coordination and collaboration of the relevant stakeholders prior to, during, and post-conflict. The solution for an equitable health service delivery is twofold, to strategically reduce these barriers for women and to increase healthcare worker motivation to enable better service delivery. Two, it is important for peacekeeping missions to contribute to improved healthcare systems for their affected populations by understanding the state of the healthcare workforce and systems of health financing in their territories. Three, those health information systems must be developed, which are disaggregated on the basis of sex so that gender data is readily available and equal and equitable health service may be able to be provided. Four, equitable health financing on the basis of gender may include a firm action taken by the governments to regulate the health sector, especially in terms of price control, public financing of income and wealth on the basis of tax, and a progressive taxation to regulate and mobilize health resources. And five, a disability card should be distributed for the poorest women in society who have zero, little access to basic facilities in the COVID pandemic. The fourth cure, ladies and gentlemen, is implementing a strong five-point unified poverty alleviation strategy across the board to ensure the following priorities are handled in conflict zones. One, a distinct strategy to pursue the famous three-prong approach of social safety nets, social insurance, labor market programs in all conflict zones with the assistance of IFIs. Two, payment system digitization and creation of innovative options to make sure the outreach increases, the timing of the stipends improves, and the pilferages reduce. Three, address social protection product innovations to all SDGs to ensure that they are smart, tracked, monitored and comparatively analyzed across conflict zones, competitively linking them to disbursement of grants. Four, a, he a heavy combination of unconditional and conditional cash transfers to ensure the right motivations to exit poverty exists amongst the vulnerable communities. And five, a large array of graduation from poverty products with inclu uh, economic inclusion models being implemented, which have been tried, tested, measured beforehand to produce the fastest livelihood and job creation force multipliers. And now the fifth cure, ladies and gentlemen, this is reform agenda is improving the election processes in conflict zones through the following five point strategy. Number one, an election reform agenda for each conflict zone devised by a high-level decision-making steering committee comprising of high-level election experts from the following organizations. 
Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, Department of Peace Operations, UNDP Office of Human Rights Commission, UN Volunteers, UN Office for Project Services, UNESCO, UN Women, IOM, Regional Electoral Observer Groups. Number two, the specialization of services through the creation of best practice units in order to refocus the offering and conflict zones of the following technical assistance, conducive environment creation, organizing electoral processes, certification, observation, supervision, and electoral promotion. Number three, a model protocol and charter for ensuring the following, increased voter participation, controlling false information, keeping women candidates safe, increasing peace messages, enhancing gender sensitive election rules, and finance resource allocation for women candidates. Number four, having a national sovereignty norm-based approach to electoral reforms, which ensures enhanced credibility by including women IDPs, internally displaced persons, in election voting and as election candidates. Number five, having success stories demonstrating the age-old assumption that more women legislators enable more pro-women legislation. The sixth and final cure in the gender reform agenda ladies and gentlemen, is the execution of an improved sexual exploitation and abuse control policy through a focus on the following 10 key areas. One, continuing improved attitudes of the UN senior leadership of DPO. Two, improved training within UN missions. Three, improved access to UN complaint system with feedback to local victims on process and strengthened systems for whistleblowers. Four, policy rhetoric to be substituted by policy practice. Five, increased women hiring, filling of gender position staffing, and appoint gender watchdog ombudspersons. Six, deterrence to SEA by ensuring certainty of punishment through quick, certain, proportionate punishment. Seven, termination versus repatriation of delinquent soldiers to close the circle fully on zero tolerance. Number eight, differentiated treatment to peacekeeping babies of a consensual versus exploitative and violent nature. Number nine, continued improvement of HIV rates amongst peacekeepers and host populations by active training, testing, pre-deployment in the post. Number 10, fixing the immunity loopholes by identifying the inconsistencies within various judicial systems, improving DNA testing, improving evidence gathering mechanisms, increased recreational facilities, family hotlines, and aggressive patrolling. Ladies and gentlemen, with the above six point gender reform agenda, an expose of the current achievements of the UNDPO, and an understanding of the legal obligations currently existing in the form of UNSC resolutions, I would like to say the following departing words at Paris Talks today. Peace building, a gendered approach is a reality a work in progress. With the help of stakeholders, it can be accelerated in terms of output with an unimaginable force multiplier for peace dividends. The cure, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, is in our hands. I congratulate all the stakeholders involved in this cure. I would also like to thank the organizing committee of Paris Talks for giving me this opportunity to lay before you the peace building gender cure. Thank you.